more explicit uh, attacks on religion by people who are quite willing to be identified as uh, atheists than uh, than was the uh, pattern in the last uh, couple of decades. So uh, I do feel that uh, religion, religious activity is under some uh, greater uh, critique. Um, I also think that the formal expression of um, uh, religion has diminished in the public realm uh, to give a, a trivial but uh, typical case. Uh, we always use the open court uh, in the name of God. We don't. The Supreme Court still does. The Supreme Court still has a kind of blessing to get started. But typically the rest of the court system doesn't do that anymore. And I think it, uh, that's a, a small level, but it's uh, the There, there is uh, um, a more robust secularism than was the case uh, 40 years ago. And that dispensation from the uh, invocation of God isn't just a, a, a Ninth Circuit uh, tradition, huh? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Uh, at this point, then, uh, if anyone would like to ask questions, uh, I'd be happy to take any of them. Before you go out, it's easier for churches and scientists to say they're wrong. Maybe that's because to err is human and they're human. And the difficulty the church has is so much of the speaking is blamed on God. And we can't come back and say it back and can't come back and say it as easily do the wrong without it, in a sense uh, saying the consequences. I'll repeat the question or try to paraphrase it for everybody if they can hear it. Um, the, the, the question was asked and said that uh, Justice Noonan had indicated that uh, scientists and judges have an easier time saying some decision in the past has been wrong than do ecclesiastics, and in part that may be because much of ecclesiastical pronunciation is done in the name of God and, uh, you know, in the influence of God. Of the influence of God. Well, you're repeating the question gave me a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that twice. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an easy question, but uh, first of all, an analogy, but uh, the judges say, what we're telling you is what the Constitution says. Just like the church would say, we're telling you what God says. And so when they change their minds 30 or 40 or 50 times, people could say, what? The Constitution said that? Now it says this? And now it says that? No. People accept that that's, that's the way change occurs in an authority that uh, is used to making changes. And a great deal, of course, is expressed in ultimate terms, which, uh, if people are willing to be realistic about it, is not uh, uh, ultimate. And to give, give you a biblical example, a great deal of uh, Hebrew legislation is expressed in terms of uh, what God commanded, or sometimes what was revealed to Moses. And I would suppose that people in uh, Hebrew society realize that uh, not every new piece of legislation said to come from Moses or said to come from God actually did come from. That was the, that was the way it was phrased. 
And uh, if you're dealing with non-infallible doctrine, I think one, as one realizes how the doctrine is formulated, you realize it's not God speaking in person, it's some uh, delegate of God saying, this is what I understood at the time. I'm going to use the same question to, to uh, come to the final case you treat in the book, and that's the question of divorce and remarriage. Because I think that's the one where the church deals with the issue you raised and the issue you come to just now, which is how do we deal with what are perceived to be, in certain instances, uh, the desires of Christ himself. I, I think that uh, the particular trajectory the church has taken on the divorce and marriage question, particularly with the uh, categories of exceptions in the Fresno and Helena cases, <coughs> point to a, a great reluctance to depart from what it regards as Christ's command. And yet, this tremendous pastoral imperative so how do you, in, in, in furtherance of the same question that was being asked you, how do you deal with it when it is perceived to be, and we'll defer to your sister here as a scripture scholar to correct me uh, on any of this, uh, uh, that, that is the core command of divorce of Christ. How does the church struggle with that? Well, as I understand the doctrine, um, it makes a very really sharp, distinction between the marriages of the baptized and the marriages of the unbaptized. If you take, and, and it's very unlikely that that's going to uh, uh, change in, in our lifetime, but if you, uh, if you take the words of Christ, they are not addressed to the baptized. They are addressed to the, uh, uh, when spoken to uh, a society that accepted uh, divorce. And if you were going to put a lot of emphasis on that, you would say, well, Christ taught these unbaptized people, you can never separate. But as it is, current Catholic doctrine says that at least two-thirds of the people in the world do not marry forever. Their marriages are all desirable because they're not the mar marriages of baptized persons. They're open to dissolution. So uh, there is that uh, curious gap that uh, the words of Christ seem to apply to everyone. They in fact have been uh, restricted only to the baptized. And then there's a great deal of uh, <coughs> uh, difficulty in how that's been worked out. I, I, would, I, I would not think that the current understanding is very clear. Uh, just to pursue one uh, example uh, what's usually referred to as the Pauline privilege based on a letter of St. Paul where he tells uh, a Christian who's married to a, a non-Christian that if the non-Christian departs uh, the person, the Christian is free to marry. At what point is the first marriage dissolved? Well, if you take the, well, I, it was a teaching of Thomas Aquinas, and I think may still be the dominant teaching. The marriage, uh, or the first marriage, is dissolved at the altar of the second marriage. So the bridegroom walks down the aisle, married to A, uh, 